So I wish this song had 16 verses so that we could be completely ready. But Marcella is ready and Frederick, I'm sorry I started. Thank you very much. Good morning, church. Um, I will ask you to please forgive me. I'll try to speak really quickly, but there's a lot I need to say. It's hard to know. It's hard to know what to say and not say. So I'll really try to go quickly where I can and slow down where I need to. Um, thinking of my story, how I came to know God, it spans over a long time. What was God doing for me during that time? There are some moments when he reached out. My story involves a struggle in the dark, a complete lack of knowledge about my creator and his care for me, to meeting him. There was a force working against this. At its calmest, it was stealthy and deceptive. And at its fiercest, it waged a full offensive for my mind. I was born at the Angel, Islington in London, to a Catholic family. My grandmother attended church regularly, but my mother's generation didn't. They all held to their faith without an obvious active role in their lives, apart from major religious ceremonies. Children were initiated into their first Holy Communion and then got confirmed into the faith at the age of 10. But I don't remember seeing a Bible at home or school. The first time I went to confess to a priest, I was scared. And these things happened as a course of nature, without any explanation, and I was told to tell the priest about anything I'd done wrong. I couldn't think of anything, and I felt so under pressure I had to make something up. On leaving, and I've heard other people do that too. On leaving primary school, we were led through our confirmation. And the priest who came to prep us, he said, this choice you're making, but I thought, no, it isn't a choice. I was really aware that no one would dare say no. I don't want to, um, no, yeah. I went um, some time after that to my mum with a strange request. Mum, I want to pray, what do I do? Surprised, she hesitated and she asked, well, choose a saint. The obvious next question, who, what saint? She gave me a few choices and I chose St. Joseph. She brought me home a printed tract called a novena, entitled Invocation to St. Joseph. I remember really wanting it, waiting for it, and I memorized it and I put it under my pillow and I said it each night before I slept. With the absence of light, we grope around in the dark. At 16, I was a college student doing part-time work on Oxford Street, and I also started to go out to nightclubs. Um, life was happy, I was confident and it was really a lot of fun. At 18 I got a good job working for Thames Water. My social life took off. I didn't smoke or drink, but glasses of champagne and other stuff always was being offered. It was a bit like nice people sharing their goodies. I got invited to parties, I'm told I'd be on the guest list at clubs. I guess I had the right face or look because that's what gets you in without waiting in a queue. My connections improved, opening up the IP lounges for what that was worth. Luckily, I didn't enjoy smoking weed. A lot of my peers did, but it made me feel like sleeping, which is not the best scenario for a party. Very uncomfortable. For me, peer pressure was a question. Why does everybody like doing this? What do they get from it? In the absence of light, darkness appears to be a good thing. At 23, I met someone who had an impact on my life. Shortly after, something amazing, amazing happened on the London dance scene, Acid House Raves. An associate of mine partnered with the first outdoor rave promoter, Tony Colston Hayter, a 22-year-old genius who mastermind, masterminded a product called Sunrise. For anyone who hasn't heard of the term rave in this context, the BBC article writes, raves which could draw crowds of 20,000 or more through the 1990s were a way to, for people to immerse themselves in positive, permissive atmosphere, atmospheres away from mainstream clubs. The larger 
first I heard of was 11,000, and they actually descended on White uh, Waltham Airfield, some of you may remember in the early 90s. These raves coincided with the arrival of a social drug called ecstasy into the UK. People drove to mystery locations, revealed at the last minute so, so that enough people arrived before the police could actually come and do anything about it. They couldn't stop it. Then they danced through the night, many of them on ease, as they were called. I'm fortunate that scepticism about the consequences of taking ease made me an observer rather than going with the flow. I needed to be in control of my mind and for things to make sense. Even with privileged access at sunrise raves, I liked dancing, but I didn't really enjoy the atmosphere. It was, however, the place to be. In the absence of, of, in the absence of contact with the light, rebellion seemed like a force to be reckoned with. My relationship reached breaking point, and although I was emotionally tied up, I knew it wasn't for me and I had to move on. One night, I met Ashley, Tony's girlfriend, and we clicked immediately. She said she wanted to go and meet her sister in Thailand, and wow, I saw a door fly open and I jumped. I'll come with you. She was shocked when I turned up at the Thai embassy, it was two days later, and a month later we were in Bangkok. The darkness constantly tries, strives to take us prisoner, but the, but the light offers a way of escape. Thailand was fantastic. The world was so much more than I had experienced. Sometimes people ask, what are you, meaning religion? When I heard myself say Roman Catholic a few times, it occurred to me that I was making a statement about what I believe. Yet the only reason I owned this label was my grandmother. So my belief was based on random chance. I felt uncomfortable. This lacked any reason, evidence or proof. I confronted an unknown entity saying, God, I'm really sorry, but I can't believe in you based on my lineage. I'm sorry, but I can't believe in you unless I know for myself that you exist. And I realized I knew nothing. A few months later, Ashley and I went to Himachal Pradesh in the Himalayas. After some more adventures, she left to Thailand and I went south to meet my sister who'd arrived in Goa. Six months after leaving home, my ex found out my location and he came. The unsolicited intrusion was a shock, but God used him in a most amazing way. One night at a hilltop party, I heard him talking to young people who had grown up in a pantheistic cult. They were sannyasins, a guru-led cult base in an ashram in Pune. He really sold it to them. If you want to know about life, read the Bible. It's the book of life. He had figures, sales, translation data. A very competent Bible salesman. In that moment, the Holy Spirit impressed me. I need to read that book, and it was a very deep impression. But I knew it had to wait till I got home. The darkness will pursue you to keep hold of you, but the light uses extraordinary means to achieve its end. Some months later, I got back, and the impression was stronger than ever. I needed a Bible. I started to read it and it gained my interest. I had no need for the things that used to entertain me. There'd been a paradigm shift. One day on my doorstep, a friend walked past and she was so surprised to see me. Before I left, we were, we were going to raves together. She was the only female DJ to play for Sunrise and she had a promising future. Marcella, what are you doing? She cried when she saw me. And I asked her the same, and she shocked me. Marcella, I'm reading the Bible. What? I couldn't believe it. One night at the rave, she'd had an eye-opening experience, like scales fell off her eyes. She saw evil happening all around her, and she had a strong spiritual conversion. There were guns to protect large quantities of money, and there was power obtained by fear. When 
God opened her eyes, she was so scared she fled the country, not showing up for her next DJ slot. We were in constant contact after that as we read the Bible independently and shared what we found. It was clear that something was guiding us. There were strange and exciting indications. If she had a question, she asked a friend who, she, who had been brought up an Adventist. One day she told me we should be worshipping God in church on Sabbath because it's the fourth commandment. I felt that there were too many churches out there. How could I know which one? I told her to go ahead, but me, I wouldn't. I'd encountered ideas from different religions during my year away, and although I was reading a Bible, my mind was really open to the fact that God could be anywhere. However, the task of examining a plethora of possibilities seemed too hard for me to achieve, perhaps even in my lifetime. At that daunting prospect, I got on my knees and I prayed, God, I know you're there, but how can I know where you are? You need to show me. My friend went out the next Saturday to find a church with no luck. A week later, she found Holloway SDA Church and started to go. She asked me to come to a Bible study and I did. I couldn't fault the elders. They gave answers to every question put forward and they could take me to a relevant scripture that really spoke to my heart. It was music to my ears. But actually, at that moment, I wasn't ready to commit. The light wants to be found. Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Right then, two things happened. Firstly, I had the most amazing dream that I need to tell you. I was a little child playing in a field. Quite far over there in the distance was a figure standing. Despite this distance, he could read my thoughts and we communicated telepathically. I was carefree, him managing a harvest and providing for my every need. I came across a bicycle and I wanted to have a try. I looked over to him for approval and knowing my mind, he looked at me, but his eyes said, you shouldn't, but I won't stop you. Perfect, that was as good as a yes. So I jumped on and I started riding. I was happy that I could ride so well, and I got faster until the speed was so high it took off into the sky. I, it was a frightening speed, and in a second I realised that if I hit a tiny pebble, I would be pulverised immediately. As I hesitated, the bike wobbled and I fell off, and I landed in a field running down the side of a cliff. There were many fields, and I landed in a, a field of thorns, so I couldn't even move to save myself. Immediately, the figure back from the beginning was, in the, was there with me, and despite the distance I travelled, he laid himself down in the thorns, and his robe dropped down to me to reach me. I pulled myself up, and over his body I walked to get back to safety. At that moment, I woke up in a euphoric state, having experienced deep emotional connection to the person in the dream. However, I didn't want it to be Jesus. I wanted it to be someone tangible in the material realm. Secondly, I'd left my ex in India and the Bible had become inspirational to me. I told him we were on different paths, going in different directions, and then I said it was over. I found the, in the Bible I found ideas that made sense and I wanted to live them. Not very long after I received a call from a friend of my ex in India telling me he was in a bad predicament. He was incarcerated and needed help. Initially I said no, but then I decided, well, I could just help him and come back. I'll come straight back. The process took me six months to sort. And in that time, I became distracted from my newfound love, the Bible. Not having anyone to encourage me, I gradually lost sight of my focus before I left home. I was surrounded by New Age spiritualism, all my associates linked to the sannyasin ashram, but I was oblivious to its dark nature. The Adventist understanding of prophecy had satisfied my need for evidence that God exists and is omnipotent, and this made me consider him seriously. However, it is written, if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries, all knowledge, but do not have love, I'm nothing. And I didn't have the love part because I didn't know Jesus, and neither did I know his enemy. I held on to certain 
own truths I'd embraced in the Bible, thinking I, I had succeeded in my quest because I knew that God exists. A naive babe, I left a nurturing environment and I was alone in a dark place. Darkness never presents itself in its true light because it's too ugly. So I decided that there are several ways to God, not only through Jesus, the Adventist way, and I was again lost. I made Sanyasin friends with whom I reconnected back in London and I completely forgot about the church. If someone in the dark gets a glimpse of the light and moves towards it, the darkness does all in its power to lure, distract and confuse them. Four years rolled out, during which time I tried to benefit from my unshackled single status. I should have been flying, enjoying life, but something wasn't right. A Sanyasin friend asked me if I could look after his farmhouse in Gayak, France, while the family were away. Of course I could. What happened there over a two-week period, I need to condense into a few sentences. My new age connections had opened a door that gave dark powers access to my life. What played out was the culmination of a struggle for my mind. Someone who'd made friends with me on an art course asked to come over there with me. She'd been super ordinary and nice, nothing spiritual about her before then. But there she did strange things like reading leaves left in the bottom of teacups and drinking wine where she'd never drunk before. Things that happened there were bizarre. They defied explanation, but there was a presence trying to help me to understand. I had two dreams at that time. In the first, I saw a, I saw a full portrait of this companion really revealing her nature. One Friday evening, I started to recognize that dark powers were working through her, and I withdrew in fear. If only I would have realized that night the power in the name Jesus Christ. I had to face this person the next morning, knowing who she was. In my second dream, I made a cupboard, and I had a great sense of accomplishment in finishing it. Where it would normally open, there were no handles, so it couldn't be opened from the outside. With God's protection, I endured the events and came home. I felt a strong, protective presence bringing me back. On my return, initially, I was frightened to go out. My flatmate had also been in France for the first week, and she corroborated the things that were not right with the other person, which was a great relief, because who else would understand what happened there? If the darkness can't deceive you, it can try a full-on assault but even its deadliest weapons are useless against Jesus. Negative interference didn't stop immediately, but one day, out of the blue, that beautiful dream from four years before came back, flooding my mind so clearly. I was awestruck. I saw that that dream had revealed what was going to happen to me from when I met Jesus until I ended up in the field of thorns in Gayak. There were symbols in that dream that represented the landscape there. And I couldn't believe God, in his gracious mercy, would do such a thing for me. It was magnificent. I saw that the moment I came into contact with Jesus in the dream was when I came into contact with the Adventist church. But I had decided to find a way without him. That choice led me into life-threatening danger, where Jesus came to rescue me. As I realised what God had done for me, without hesitation, I knew what I had to do. The next Sabbath, I went back to an Adventist church. Amen. Thank you, Marcel. Now we are going to go to our Sabbath school classes. They are the same places as always. If you need assistance to find any of the classes, please talk to any of the Thank you.